get to spend a little bit over an hour together today. And is the volume okay for everybody? Yes? Yes? Okay. Um, examining law enforcement responses to youth who are involved in the sex trade. And mm -hmm. as you all already sort of have a sense from me, I like to root us. So I'm going to take us way back to 1910, just so we have this reminder of how, even though some of us are saying this is a brand new issue and we know nothing about this, this group of young people have existed for a very long time. We've just been using different terms to refer to them and or to their experiences. So in 1910, the Mann Act um, was passed, and this is some of the language from it that's most relevant for sort of our discussion framing it today, which is it to criminalize knowingly transporting or causing to be transported or aiding or assisting uh, in obtaining transportation for dot, 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 um, any woman or girl for the purpose of prostitution or debauchery or for any other immoral purpose um, and or to engage in any other immoral practice. So why I'm bringing this up now, get some the bewildered looks, is this act, the Man Act, was the first time where we really began to see uh, victim-centered language being used in legislation about some people's experiences in the sex industry. At this historical moment, it was women and girls. Um, and it was trying to prohibit the transportation across state lines of women and girls for prostitution or other immoral purposes. And what was happening in that moment is there was this larger boundary crisis like, well, why in 1910 would, would this be coming up? There was this larger boundary crisis happening as communities were becoming less um, rooted in rural areas and moving into urban areas. So it was the first time that women were really able to live outside of family homes and have that be OK. And so there was this crisis about, what are we going to do now that women are on their own? And wh how do we protect them? Um, how do we deal with urbanization? But what we notice, which is some of what I alluded to in the talk earlier today, is there's no mention of men or boys in that historical moment, the, the terms transgender, genderqueer weren't even there. So it was really, um, in many ways, set to protect women and girls from themselves. And this is exemplified, there was uh, some research that was done that looked at cases um, where people had been convicted under the Mann Act. And what they found, and these numbers don't add up to 100%, they exceed that because some show up in more than one category, is that 16% of the women convicted um, trading sex was secondary to their interstate travel with the boyfriend or husband. So perhaps they had gone on a trip, they get there, all of a sudden we've run out of money, how are we going to get back? And then the woman would engage in prostitution. 15% of the women uh, were regularly involved in trading sex to support themselves, and they were arrested when they uh, solicited at a hotel across state lines. So there wasn't somebody transporting them. They transported themselves, and this is what they were doing. 23% um, of women traveled with boyfriend across state lines, and what was happening in those situations, neither of them were involved in prostitution, but one or both of them were married and having an extramarital affair. Typically, the spouse of one of the people would call in a complaint to the police department. Police would show up, and then both uh, the woman and man involved would be charged as co-conspirators in their own trafficking. So put a little asterisk mark at the co-conspirators, because that's going to link back to some of what's happening in current day. And then 46% of the women who identified as prostitutes um, and were arrested for, they were arrested for aiding or securing transportation for other women to cross state lines for prostitution. So when we look at this data, clearly it's a very different picture than what emerges if we just looked at the legislative language around the Mann Act. And we're seeing this more times than not people convicted under this weren't being forced to sell sex. Um, they weren't necessarily even traveling with somebody else across state lines. So now when we fast forward many, many years to um, 2000 with the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, it's the reemergence of a victim-centered approach to young people involved in the sex trade. So leading up to it, the main language that was used was juvenile prostitution or juvenile delinquents. Um, and you know, largely the emphasis is still on cisgender young women um, and adults. 
And it's still evoking this idea that really started with the Mann Act of people being kidnapped and forced into the sex trades. But as we see sort of with the discrepancies with what happened with the Mann Act in terms of who was prosecuted versus who we thought we would, when we look at uh, some of the research that folks have done across the country examining when is it that young people who are trading sex are viewed as victims um, by law enforcement, what they found, and this is through reviewing incident reports, so anytime police have an interaction with somebody, it gets written down in an incident report, so you can go through and read those if you have access to them. Um, that when a young person encounters a police officer, they're more likely to be considered a victim um, if the attention came to the police through a report rather than police action. So it could be I called in saying, hey, I'm concerned about this person, they're at this location, will you go check on them? Or I'm a service provider and this is what's going on, this person needs help. As opposed to we're doing an undercover operation or we're placing decoy ads on Backpage. So if it was a report, more likely to be a victim. More likely to be considered a victim if there was a third party involved. Uh, if the young person was a cisgender young woman, if they had a history of running away, if they were younger, um, which I think reflects a lot of our health notions of the younger you are, the less capable you are of making your own decisions. If they appeared frightened, if they were cooperative with law enforcement, and if they had no prior arrest record. So what I can say is, for the groups of young people who we know are involved in trading sex, those who fit this conceptualization of an ideal victim is very, very small. Um, and then that leads to, even though we've got the TDPA that says no young person should be arrested, it helps us maybe better understand what are the factors that influence when a young person is cited with a prostitution offense. Talked about that in the keynote, so I'm going to skip over that. So that sort of background, right? We've got these historical acts, we've got the TVPA, we can sort of see the ways in which things maybe aren't implemented um, as thoroughly or um, sort of accurately as we thought they would be with the legislation. I want to spend a little time talking about the major responses, regulatory frameworks that we're seeing across the nation as it relates to young people who are trading sex. So we'll go from criminalization to decriminalization to partial decriminalization. So with criminalization, there's still plenty of states that either have kept intact um, their penal codes where regardless of age, somebody can be charged with a prostitution offense. So that means in those states, if you're under 18, even though at the federal level you're considered a victim of sex trafficking, you can still be arrested for selling sex. Um, I'll get to partial decrim in a moment. But so what ends up being problematic is that we hear from some young people how they've had interactions with law enforcement where they view them as an exploiter. And this is not to say that all law enforcement officers, all police officers are problematic. Absolutely are not. And we'll hear from some young people that there are relationships they have that are supportive with police officers. But what this does say is if a young person has even one negative experience with a police officer or knows somebody who has had a negative experience, it makes it increasingly less likely that they will think of police as a source of support or someone they can turn to when things are going wrong. Um, I'll share a quote in a minute about uh, the experience of one young person as it relates to that. And so what we're hearing from young people, some of them are experiencing physical abuse from law enforcement officers, some of them it's sexual abuse, typically in the guise of, if you give me a blowjob, I won't arrest you. Um, but for some of our other young people, it's profiling on other factors. So marginally housed and homeless young people who are out on the streets, in some communities are readily available to meet quotas. So it's sort of quality of life offenses, or in New York City they talk a lot about getting tickets for jumping the turnstiles. Um, but all of these interactions, if they're viewed as negative by young people, again, diminishes the likelihood that they would ever reach out to police. And within criminalized um, settings, what we see is the legislation is often focused on clients and third parties. And this idea if we just make the penalties severe enough, this social issue will disappear, 
right? So if it's just, if you end up, maybe if you have to face a 25 year sentence in prison uh, for forcing somebody to sell sex, then you'll stop doing it. But we can look to other social issues to realize how this, what they call in the sort of theoretical world, a rational approach to deviance doesn't work. We can look to the drug war, right? We kept increasing, increasing, increasing sentencing for drug offenses and it hasn't had a positive impact and has often led to mass incarceration of communities of color. Um, so within this, a lot of attention is not being focused on those structural factors that are creating vulnerabilities that either other people take advantage of with the young person or the young person decides I have to meet these needs in my own way. And it's really overly relying on uh, a legal response so this quote, I know there's a SAGE program here, <coughs> nearby here in Portland. It's not that program. This is a program SAGE that was in San Francisco. They have since closed, but they were um, in existence for over 20 years. And so a case manager was sharing with me the experience of one young woman she was working with, and this experience happened down in Southern California. She got in his car, and he said that he didn't have money and that they were going to drive to the gas station for him to be able to use an ATM, get some gas, and get some money. And one of the things that she said was that he let her fondle him on the entire drive. You know, she said it was at least a solid five minutes. And one of the things she asked me, she said, I don't understand, if he's an undercover cop and I'm a minor, isn't he not supposed to, you know, let me do that? That's something that I do hear commonly, is that officers seem to take definite advantage, you know, and become yet another exploiter. So again, the, the point of bringing this out is to not characterize all law enforcement as problematic, but it is to point out that when there is that difference in power, certain people will abuse the power that they have. And so if a young person knows that they're involved in something that's criminalized, they don't feel like they have the ability or capability to speak out if something's wrong or to even make a report about something like this um, if it happens because I feel the energy sort of lowering in the room. I will say right now, it's, it's heavy stuff. Um, the presentation will continue, and we're going to also talk about ways in which there have been successful cross-sector collaborations with law enforcement, and some really interesting policies that have come out. So just bear with me if you need to get up and move, or wriggle, or color, do what you need to get through this part of it. So other states have opted for full decriminalization. Some of the examples are California, which is where I'm based, also Illinois. And what this means is they have removed from their penal codes, they've added it saying basically if you're under 18, you can't get charged with a prostitution offense. And there aren't stipulations there. It's not like, oh, if it's your first offense, or oh, if you go to a diversion program, we won't do this. It's just flat out, you can't get arrested for it. Um, what does happen in those two situations is instead of it being a law enforcement response, the young person is adjudicated to child welfare. So on one hand, from a harm reduction perspective, step in the right direction, right? Limiting uh, charges on a young person's rap sheet, limiting interactions with juvenile justice in general, very positive. Um, going to child welfare, we also have to be critical of that system too, right? So in California, there have been studies done that show between 50 to 80 percent of young people who are involved in the sex trade have already been child welfare involved. And so then it begs the question of, okay, if they were already involved, what does circling them back to that system achieve? And perhaps there's things that can be done within the child welfare system to create more of a wraparound uh, support system so that young people don't fall through the cracks. So it's really, it's complicated, right? There's not, I don't think there's an easy solution and, all of the systems we're connected to have moments where they fall apart or things don't go as planned. So it's inviting ourselves to constantly turn the lens back on ourselves and say what's, what's working well here and what isn't. So even though young people can't get arrested, there's still some challenges. One, in some of the locations, it takes a while before police officers, all of them become aware that this is the new law. Um, so you'll get young people being cited with prostitution offenses that ultimately get dropped but it's a, it's a whole process. Um, there's also, I hear, throughout the US, sometimes an unwillingness of child welfare workers to take on certain cases. So in New York, case managers spoke a lot about how if they were trying to refer somebody who was 16 or 17, 
they felt like the child welfare system was just stalling until the person would age out, um, or that the child welfare system was not responsive when they needed them to sign to get the young person access to mental health care, other things. Uh, and then within the California model, there's still some subjectivity allowed that could result in a young person being detained, put in temporary custody. So if a law enforcement officer feels like there is not a safe, appropriate housing option for that young person that they've interacted with, they know is trading sex, they can still hold them at juvenile justice. So what do we do with that, right? And to me, that's sort of the call to action of, I know throughout the US, one of the needs that routinely gets named, needs that routinely gets named is a variety of housing options for young people with different thresholds, right? It could be emergency, transitional, long-term, or even having 24-7 drop-in centers so that young people who are trying to avoid child welfare involvement can show up and know that their whereabouts won't be reported. So if we don't have the appropriate housing options, the young people are still experiencing this as if they're being arrested. It's hard to separate out Oh, I'm not arrested, but I'm being put in, in a cell. Um, and then the reality is, and we see this in San Francisco, so I've been doing a case file review of prostitution and human trafficking incidents from 2009 and 10, 14 and 15. And on the surface, you look at San Francisco numbers, and it is very rare, even uh, prior to SB 1322, that a young person was being arrested and cited for prostitution. So you would think, oh, they're just, they're not getting arrested at all. They're getting cited with other offenses. So it's thinking about, you know, what are the reasons why they're being cited? Is that in the best service of this young person? What are the other ways? Is that a question? Well, I'm curious, does this accommodate, like an attempt to decriminalize? I, I can't imagine that somebody is, the only illegal activity that they are engaging in is trading sex. So what if they have a weapon on them? What if they have paraphernalia on them? Is the attempt going to be to not have them have a criminal record or is it just that they're going to get cited with possession? Okay, so that's spot on. What happens with the de this full decriminalized model is they just can't get cited for prostitution offenses. Yeah. And for many of the young people who are trading sex, you're absolutely right, there are other activities they're engaged in that are criminalized, and they're continuing to be cited with that. Um, do I jump there now? Maybe I'll Sorry. jump there now. No, it's okay. So what I will say is it's been interesting um, speaking primarily with public defenders throughout California and seeing the ways in which, a young, I was just uh, working on a young woman's case, she was 17, was being trafficked, there were third parties who were getting involved, um, basically forcing and coercing her to sell sex. In the, um, in the course of her connecting with a client who thought he was going to have sex with her, he, she knew these other guys were gonna show up and rob him. The guy got shot in the arm. He's okay, he lived. Um, he's also a registered sex offender. So he's in a car with a 17 year old thinking he's going to have sex with her. Police show up over the course of the investigation, realize, oh, she's involved in this somehow, realize like she was selling sex. And initially, um, they were going to charge her, I can't remember what it was, and the defense put in an affirmative defense saying she's a trafficking victim. She can't, right, she can't be charged for any of this because she was a victim of a crime. And so the prosecuting attorney then raised the charge to attempted murder because that's not precluded from an affirmative defense. So now you have a young woman who was being trafficked, um, who was in the car when the guy got shot. She didn't have the gun, she didn't pull the trigger. The guy who pulled the trigger wasn't even charged with that. And so we get this overzealous sometimes prosecution. And I think an attempt to try to prove that we've gotten the traffickers and the quote unquote bad people off the streets. Yeah, there was a hand there. I was just going to say, in, you know, working with DHS and some of the youth that I work with, um, we have seen, I think, a time or two, not all the time, but sometimes the youth are being, there's talk about the youth being charged for other criminal offenses, even though, you know, when they're caught up in um, some sort of exploitation or trafficking experience. So it definitely happens, and it's very unfortunate because 
I feel like sometimes the, the conversation is also around how do we get them to services and get them mandated to them? Because if they're not going into the juvenile system, they're not really mandated and have to participate. Um, so it's a, it's a huge conversation and an unfortunate one that sometimes we're like, I don't know, I'm struggling with like, ah, we don't want them to feel forced. We want them to integrate into them as they as they choose to and, and, and want to. Yeah, that's um, it's interesting to hear. And you know, I spoke to it a little bit with the keynote around the tension with mandated services, right? That it's, for some you know, people, they experience that as just something else that's being forced upon them, and or what they're being told they have to go do it doesn't feel like the most pressing or relevant for them. And so, it just again, it invites us to think through. Yes, we want young people to get services. What are the dynamics and the situations in which we can structure that so they feel more self-empowered and agentic, as if they're the ones, as they should be, naming, here are the needs that I have. And we as adults and providers might think, oh, what you really need is this. And in general, over the long term, as young people get their needs met and realize agencies are really going to respond to them and meet them where they're at, some of that other stuff that we might come into the room with saying they need, they'll get to. But there's there's certain things that they need first. Uh, sure, one more. Uh, just a, for a bit of clarification, what how does this affect then um, somebody who's underage who is a pimp or a trafficker themselves, and how how has this law affected them uh, specifically? Great question. So facilitating somebody else's involvement in training sex, be it you're a trafficker, or a third party, or a pimp, is not decriminalized. Okay. So you can still and do still see young people being charged um, with pimping, with pandering, with human trafficking. Um, and, this might be a good point to bring it in, although I think it comes in later, is they're being charged similar to the Man Act as co-conspirators. So what I've been seeing in some locations throughout the country is you have a young person who uh, police encountered perhaps out on the stroll. They bring them in. There are other offenses happening. Um, so if you're in a full decriminalized, okay, we can't charge you for this, but we're going to get you for loitering or public nuisance. Maybe you had drugs on you. And then there's sort of this leverage use of if you participate in the prosecution, if you tell us information about your third party or what's going on, we'll drop all these other charges. But if you don't, we're going to charge you as a co-conspirator of your own trafficking. So there's lots of different ways, even in a model like the full decriminalization, which is better, right? The young person can't be charged with selling sex. There are all sorts of ways that things can go sideways and collateral harms are, are still occurring. So then we've got partial decriminalization. Um, New York. Sure. Sorry, can I just be clear? In Oregon, that's impossible to do. So just so you know, in Oregon, the legislative history is you cannot be a co-conspirator or aid in your own exploitation. So just so you know, that their states be. are differently, but for example, the promoting and compelling statutes, which are the most used, you cannot compel yourself or you promote yourself. So just one Good for Oregon. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, with partial decriminalization, so New York, they have that model with the safe harbor. My understanding of Oregon, and there's lots of experts in the room, so you will correct me if I'm slightly off on this, um, is that in general, young people cannot be charged with selling sex, but it appears to me through looking at the law that if you're 16 or 17, there's still the possibility that you could be arrested. Um, and so in systems like this, it's like, okay, so there's one group of young people who are legally protected from being arrested. There's another group that isn't. So you end up with this weird dual status of victim and criminal. And again, it, it, it recreates this thing of who are good victims, right? So the second you turn 16, all of a sudden you're not a victim and we can charge you. In New York with the safe harbor, there's lots of other um, requirements. So you have to go through services. It can only be your first offense. And we know for many young people, they move in and out of trade sex as they need to, or as the situations require of them. And so to limit legal protections from being charged with prostitution to only those who it's their first time offense really ignores the cyclical nature of this um, and the ways in which young people move in and out and will need different types of support. So I'm sure all of us are in agreement in this room that 
having a record at any age is a detriment. And there's lots of things that make it much harder to do uh, once you are system involved. I've already spoken about the Mann Act. Um, I touched briefly on co-conspirators, but I'll share this quote from Robin Richardson. At the time that she shared this, she was the Equal Justice Fellow of the Urban Justice Center Sex Workers Project. And she said, when young people who trade sex, all of whom are considered victims of sex trafficking by federal law, are convicted as traffickers, they not only have the extra injury of being a co-conspirator with their trafficker, they have the extra stigma that will bar them from a lot of services for victims of trafficking, even though they are victims. So again, thank you to JR's comment. It seems like that is not what's possible here in Oregon. Uh, but it is happening throughout the U.S. And also, odds are you're working with young people who move, right? They haven't only been here. So they could have cases from other locations where it's following them and impacting them. I know that that's, that might be the case where you can't be a co-conspirator in your own trafficking, but we know that systems are complex and sometimes they're stable, so where you have people working with multiple other people that are being trafficked. And I know that sometimes people get charged for being a co-conspirator when their trafficker has instructed them to do something, um, and then they're getting charged for those offenses. So even though Oregon may not have it, so you're co-conspirating your own trafficking, sometimes when people are coerced into doing these things, they are still getting charged for co-conspirating. That's absolutely co right. So that I just wanted to bring a uh, distinction to that. Thank you. Yeah, and that's really, that detail is super important. Because we heard earlier, right, Young people who are trading sex are also oftentimes the third party for another young person. And that relationship may not be inherently problematic or abusive, abusive or it might be. It might be that they have a trafficker or pimp who's like, okay, now you're gonna recruit these people and you're gonna teach them how to do this. And so then you end up with a young person in either of those situations who can be charged as a trafficker, not co-conspirator to their own trafficking, to JR's point, but can be charged. And so it's, it's just important to hold all this because this is this is what's playing out. Um, on to positive news. So many states, including or Oregon, have enacted remedies where you can vacate convictions. So if we're all in agreement that a young person under the age of 18 should be considered a victim of sex trafficking if, if they're selling sex, they shouldn't have that on their record. So in those places where either Prostitution is still entirely criminalized regardless of age. A vacator remedy allows you to go in and have that removed from their record. Or for places that now have laws that are in compliance with the TVPA, it allows you to go back and remove things from somebody's records. But in general, um, vacator there, remedies. Sure. So is there a, a timeline so you can go back in before laws are in to vacate? Yeah, so you can go back from before um, the vac vacator remedy was enacted. It requires, what I hear some of the barriers being, it, it requires people knowing about it. It requires having attorneys who are willing to work on it, typically pro bono. Um, and in general, any reduction on someone's rap sheet is good. So it might not remove, um, I can't see your name tag, but to this person's point, might not remove other offenses that they were charged with at the time, but at least it's getting something off. So there was recommendations uh, put out about if we're going to do vacator remedies, what would we want them to entail? Because most of them um, are limited. So I know in Oregon, child sex trafficking victims may vacate delinquency adjudications and expunge records related to prostitution offenses, but other crimes they may have committed while being trafficked aren't eligible for vacation, so right, that's a limit. Um, we have to think how can we encompass everything that's going on in a person's life when they are being trafficked and make sure that doesn't follow them legally. So we want the scope to be broad enough to cover arrest and convictions for crimes beyond prostitution. You also don't want to have to require official documentation to certify that someone's a victim, um, but if it's presented, would want it to uh, count as presumptive evidence. So it's how do we make this as accessible as possible for folks? The more requirements, the more paperwork, the less likely it is going to be happen. Also, no requirement for proof of rehabilitation. Um, in some locations, to be eligible to have a record vacated, you have to show that you've done so many months of services or gone through so many groups, which puts an unnecessary burden of responsibility on the crime victim. 
So really, if you are a crime victim and you want to have something expunged from your record that happened while you were a crime victim, you shouldn't have to jump through hoops to prove that you're worthy to have that done. Of course, want to ensure confidentiality and continue to seal records. Want to remove the ability for judges to have discretion, um, just so that it's consistent. And to your point, is to ensure retroactive application. So in some locations, it's not possible retroactively, which is sort of absurd. Um, and I've always wondered, it seems like there should be a pretty simple way that you could just go through as a DA, um, go through your electronic system or whatever it is, see in your state if someone's under 18, if there's any type of prostitution offense on the record, and just clear it without the person even having to do anything. Um, I have yet to see that enacted anywhere yet. I'm not sure why. So let's switch to something that's super current, um, which is FOSTA and SESTA. Just out of curiosity, show of hands, who has heard of these? Okay, and of those who have heard of it, who thinks it's awesome? Who's not, okay, who's not quite sure? And who's terrified? Okay, so for those who don't know, because it seems like there's a pretty good mix in the room, some are aware, some aren't. Um, what this does, FOSTA does, it amends Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And that means that websites um, can be prosecuted if they knowingly engage in the promotion or, or facilitation of prostitution or facilitate traffickers in advertising the sale of unlawful sex acts with sex trafficking victims. So before I, which I'm sure you all know is coming, before I jump into my critiques of FOSTA and SESTA, what I will say is that prosecutors can and absolutely should identify third parties that are collaborating with human traffickers and prosecute them. And I know that there are a lot of people who've experienced sex trafficking that want the right to be able to bring cases against their traffickers. So I'm in no way saying there's not a role for prosecution and law enforcement. Um, what I am saying is acts like these are so broad that they're going to create harm for sex trafficking victims and people who are consensually or circumstantially doing sex work. Why? So, one, if we think about the language, initially it's talking about facilitating or promoting prostitution, and then it's saying, or basically enabling human traffickers. So those are two separate things. So if, if you want to present it as we're trying to eradicate prostitution entirely or sex work, sure. Um, but this was presented as anti-trafficking. And so when we end up with such a broad definition of what is now legally culpable, we end up with websites disappearing, like Backpage, that people are using to stay safe. And that includes people who are being trafficked, right? So being able to advertise online allows you to screen people more thoroughly, um, allows you to have more contact with them to figure it out. Maybe you can start to build a regular client base. Um, you can also, through online venues, share information with other people, such as doing bad date lists of, hey, there's this person in the community who's a perpetrator, who's a predator. This is the information you need to know about them. Or share things on how you stay safer while doing this. All of that fits into promoting prostitution. So you have really important harm reduction methods and approaches that are now disappearing because people are afraid we could be prosecuted under um, FOSTA and SESTA for this. The other thing I'll say is when we remove online venues, it doesn't mean that people just stop selling sex. They figure out a different way to do it, which typically what we're seeing is they're moving back out onto the streets sort of this shell game. We crack down on street-based prostitution, folks move indoors. Then we find ways to crack down on indoors, they come back out. Um, and so whether you are a sex trafficking victim of any age, whether you're a sex worker, whether you're someone just doing what you have to do to survive, being out on the streets is far more dangerous than working online. The rates of violence increase significantly from clients, from folks who live in the community. We also see an increase, what we've, we've been seeing in San Francisco post FOSTA SESTA is the number of folks out on the stroll on the mission have doubled 
and there's far more folks who fit that stereotypical definition of pimps and traffickers also out there now trying to connect with these people because they're like, you need a way to stay safe now that you don't have the ability to screen people on your own and do this on your own. You want to couple with us. And then also a number of law enforcement agencies came out against, them, against FOSTA and SESTA, including the Department of Justice, because it can impede law enforcement efforts. So no matter how folks in this room may feel about law enforcement efforts, the reality is for as long as ads have been online, police officers will screen them, right? And it could be looking for people who are underage. It could be um, DAs scrubbing the ads for phone numbers. So if they have a case against somebody who's a trafficker, seeing if that phone number pops up in other locations. Looking at pictures of people as well. So it's impeding it that way. And we can see there was a study, this was um, included in, I think it was the 2000 and 16, I'll have to look back at the citation, um, trafficking in persons report that our federal government issues. And they were saying that being able to access sites like Backpage, the number of identified victims of sex trafficking increased over a seven year period from fewer than 31,000 up to nearly 78,000. So clearly that's in some ways been an effective tool to be able to find folks who are being trafficked, also to identify people who are, being, um, who are the traffickers. And then lastly, it's, sure, there's a... Is that, I'm not understanding that data point. Are you saying that being able to access Backpage led to the increase, or being unable? Being able to look through ads on Backpage... Being able to look through ads... ...resulted in a higher number of victims being identified. Oh, victims being identified, okay. Yeah. I didn't hear the Yeah, thank you for asking clarification. I'm sure someone else heard that differently, too, so that's great. Um, so the reality is, if somebody's being trafficked, they're being forced to sell sex. Removing online venues doesn't remove the expectations that they have to bring in a certain amount of money. So they now have to figure out other ways to do that. Oftentimes it's going on the streets, much more unsafe for them. Perhaps adding other criminalized activities to what they're doing to bring in money, which then adds increased charges. So ultimately I think of FOSTA and SESTA type legislation as whack-a-mole that some of us feel good when it passes of, yeah, we've done this thing and we've shut down these websites and we're going to eradicate trafficking. And it's just going to pop up somewhere else. I mean, already speaking with law enforcement officers in San Francisco and other locations, we're like, yeah, there are these other websites that have popped up already. There's some stuff on the dark web where people are moving to offshore hosting. All makes it harder for law enforcement. Um, so it hasn't been, oh, we've eradicated this venue where, yes, people have been advertised against their will, and yes, people under the age of 18 have been advertised or have advertised themselves. I'm not disputing that, but I'm just saying there are some very real harms that are occurring because of its passage. Yeah. I was just going to say, I heard of these two laws from uh, an individual that I volunteer with in another capacity, and um, the conceptualization that they gave me was not quite as grand as what you just provided. And um, just reminded me I need to do all my own research and checking on things. So I would take back when I raised my hand, I thought that this was awesome. Oh, okay. I would definitely backtrack and say I need to know more information, and um, what you presented is very helpful. Thank you yeah. for that. And that carries with all anti trafficking legislation. Because here's the thing nobody's for trafficking, none of us are. We all want to see a world where people are not being exploited where they're not being forced to do things that they don't want to do, where they're not turning to something they'd rather not do to get their needs met. But because there's bipartisan support, when you read the fine print of most anti-trafficking legislation, there are some horrific things lumped in there. Because most of us aren't going to read the fine print, or we're going to listen to certain people who um, will present things in a very simplistic way, that if the world was different, maybe that's how it would play out. Um, Thank you. So how do we find common ground? Maybe before I jump into this, because it's afternoon and I'm again noticing energy going down, what, if anyone's willing to share, I think you all are an open group willing to talk, what has it been like here in Portland trying to work across sectors? 
So are there instances where folks um, in social services are working with law enforcement partners? I'm seeing some shake of the head yes. Anybody who's shaking their head yes feel like saying what those um, experiences have been like? What's worked well? Where are the opportunities for improvement? As a, as a, a little bit of an overgeneralization, but the question, it's in my, my agency's experience, it's been um, person dependent as opposed to system dependent. And even person dependent within my own agency. So I'm not saying that you know, my social service agency is great, but hopefully we'll get a good police officer. That is, you, 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 there needs to be the right connection between somebody at, not at, at a JMC program, and then there are law enforcement officers that we know are going to be wonderful to work with. Others, if going back to your backside, past slide, may not know current laws or may be looking for other ways or maybe a little bit overzealous. So you know, I'm not sure that it's cross-system collaboration as it may be. But I think we're at a point where it's more cross-people yeah. collaboration. Yeah, I think that's really common, no matter where we are, that it depends on having the right person at the right agency with the right connection to another person. And so it's interpersonal yes. working relationships, not necessarily the, the system itself. <clears throat> Folks have other stuff to add? Yeah. I was hoping someone more experienced would say something, because I don't get to all the meetings. But we do have a networking meeting that's um, attended by volunteer agencies, social service agencies, and law enforcement. Um, for a long time, that meeting was primarily, um, there was nobody really involved in that meeting who had any knowledge or experience with non-trafficked sex workers mm -hmm. or this sort of stuff about how anti-trafficking laws can damage non-trafficked sex workers. Um, and so just recently, in the last few months, we've been able to invite in a couple agencies that do have that knowledge base and experience. And as um, Natalie this morning sort of conveyed, there's been some differences in philosophy and theory, and it's been rocky, but we're working through it. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And that also is happening everywhere. So the more people we invite to the table, we get differing perspectives, philosophical orientations, and it can create a lot of tension. Right, so maybe that's a, with cross systems, depending on how you frame the issue, all of a sudden you have a new group show up, it's like, wait a second, we need to think about how this is impacting people who are doing sex work who are being trafficked. Or you get folks like me, like, and how is this affecting trafficking victims if we look at it in a more complicated way? And that, the pains of those early conversations of trying to find alignment can't be understated. Yeah, we were finding um, in particular that there was a assumption that agencies that spoke of um, empowering sex workers were encouraging women to go into sex work. Yeah. And so that was a big misunderstanding that we had to clear up. Yeah. And it's amazing how quickly the misunderstandings can happen. And so I think, you know, for all of us, it, it encourages us if we think we've heard something to ask for clarification before we sort of go back to our respective agencies or our communities and paint this monolithic portrayal about what has been said if we're not quite sure. And then I think it also raises um, the reality that because of the diversity of young people who are involved in this, we need a diversity of orientations. So some people are going to feel much more comfortable going to an agency that is able to reflect back affirmation about sex work. Some people are going to be better served in an agency that's like, oh, I get that you're being forced to do this. You don't want to do it. You want a way out. You're not sure how to get out. And this has been really harmful. And then all of us need within our agencies, regardless of orientation, just to know there are a lot of different perspectives. And even though it might not be what we're doing as an agency, we need these other groups out there because some young people are going to be better served at an agency other than our own, and it's not personal. Um. I would agree that I've only been in, uh, directly connected to the system for about a year, a year and a half, but I would agree that rocky is the sense I got when I came into it. Um, and then we've had to um, take a good 
look and do focus groups and stuff and get community feedback on rebuilding a community-based service system. And I personally feel a lot of hope right now uh, with people who are at the table and that they're all working so closely with law enforcement and criminal justice folks. And um, it just feels very hopeful right now that we're all recognizing that we're here, we're all here, and we're all here for the same reason that we want to support survivors and people accountable. Yeah, I think Rocky's an okay space to be in. Rocky means we're doing stuff and we're saying things that need to be said and getting ourselves closer to having those harder conversations of where is their alignment? How do we, with, if we've established a collective vision, how do we garner all of our resources to get us there? So what I want to share is uh, just one example of a cross-system collaboration from San Francisco that's been effective. I will also name it was a very rocky process. Um, I will also name that there are, of course, groups in San Francisco that in no way want to sit down with law enforcement whatsoever, and no matter how great what I'm going to present may be, they will be critical of it because it still involves law enforcement. And that's just the lay of the land, right? I mean, it's what it is. Um, so what we did, and I think it got passed around, you all should have handouts, is over a three-year period, um, a group of folks mainly connected to the anti-trafficking task force in San Francisco. So it's government officials, um, sex worker agencies, anti-trafficking agencies, activists from both of those communities, groups working with LGBTQ communities, human rights groups, came together saying, we want to reduce the violence that people are experiencing in the sex trade. Whether they're being trafficked or not, we all are agreeing that there's a high rate of violence. And so what would it look like to create a policy where people can come forward and report when they're a victim or witness to a violent crime while they're engaged in the criminalized activity of prostitution? And also say, we're not going to cite you for misdemeanor drug offenses. And if somehow you do get cited, we won't prosecute you. So we realized we had to have separate policies. That's over there? OK. Um, the DA's office was very quick. Sort of, We met with them. We're able to share findings from research I've done over the past 15 years in San Francisco, just showing the continuation of rates of violence that people in the sex industry were experiencing, as well as their interactions with law enforcement, some of which were uh, harmful and say, we need this policy. We want to hear from the DA that folks won't be prosecuted, from the police department that they won't be arrested. Uh, but we need both of them. If we just have, you're not going to get prosecuted. The arrest piece is a barrier enough that people wouldn't come forward um, to report it. So what happened in this process? One thing that's helpful to know San Francisco has a very long history of people in the sex industry, sex workers, organizing, being at the table for um, different government groups. And so it's already known that sex workers are going to be part of these conversations. And it sounds like from what you were sharing, that might be a little bit newer here, where groups are showing up that maybe haven't always been at the table. They might have always been here. They just haven't had a seat. So there was an event that was happening at the public library, this was probably back in 2014, that was focused around end demand as an anti-trafficking initiative. Basically saying, if we can eradicate people who are wanting to buy sex, we get rid of trafficking. And I don't have the time to go into all the critiques of an end demand approach, but similar to FOSTA-SESTA, what to some people might sound really good on the surface, to others you're like, wait a second, what happens if 20% or all of my client base is gone. How am I going to survive? Or what we see a lot with policing efforts is typically the clients who are cited aren't violent. They're not perpetrators. And so you remove them from the client base, and then it leaves folks who are far more dangerous that people are trying to have as clients. And so one of the organizers of this event mentioned to someone, I guess they forgot, was a sex worker. Oh, there's this event happening. There's going to be a great researcher presenting. 
you might really like it, but we don't want the sex workers there because they're going to be disruptive. <laughs> so, of course, this person goes back to sex worker communities and says, heads up everybody, there's this thing happening that will directly impact our lived experience if it goes through. And how about we all show up with tape on our mouths and just appoint one person to make a public comment. And that's probably going to be far more impactful than all of us showing up and yelling and voicing our outrage and having picket signs. So that's what happened. Showed up, ended up with about 40, 50 people there with tape on their mouths. One person got up and said, here's all the reasons why it's problematic. You did not include any of the sex worker community organizations in this event, which then led the Department on the Status of Women um, to realize, oh yeah, we messed up. Of course sex workers need to be included in anti-trafficking conversations because in one moment somebody might be trafficked in the sex industry and the next moment they might be choosing to do sex work. It can switch back and forth. And we don't want to do anything as a city and county that is going to benefit one group but then increase harm to violence for another. That's not, that's not good programmatic uh, response. So how do we leverage this energy we have to find common ground? So we've got all these people now who are sort of energized about this. What do we do with it? So here's just sort of a smattering that I've already named of the people who came together. And what everybody was in agreement on was, OK, we're not in agreement that end demand is the way to go. And in fact, San Francisco gave back funding that they had received from demand abolition to do end demand work, because they realized it's not in alignment with what um, our city and county is wanting to do. But what we are in alignment with is we don't want to see anybody experiencing violence. And so how can we take steps to hopefully reduce violence and or better support people when they are victims of violent crime? And so we worked with uh, the police department and the DA's department to build these policies. The DA's piece was done within six months. It was very quick. Um, working with the police department was a little bit more challenging. And sort of the, the key things that we encountered in that process, one, there has been significant changeover within our police department. So over the course of trying to get this implemented, I believe we've had one, two, two new chiefs, one interim. There's a changeover of the captain of the special victims unit that we were working with. And so each time there's somebody new, it, it was almost like we had to start over because there wasn't historical knowledge, institutional knowledge being passed along. There was also a clash of cultures. So as I mentioned earlier, there are some folks in, in that group that never want to sit down with the police department and would refuse to go to the meetings. And they're like, we're grateful other people will go, but we just can't do it. And in some, reason, in some ways, it's because they've had their own histories of incarceration. Um, they've had their own experiences with law enforcement officers. And others, it's more of the long-term political um, activist goal of just eliminating incarceration and criminalization entirely. And they felt like anything that we would do with law enforcement is an endorsement of it. Um, and so the larger group hears and respects that and says, and yet, there are community members who are saying that they would love to be able to come forward when they're a victim of a crime to report it. But because they know they can get arrested, they're not going to. And so we also have to speak to their needs. Even though you might have this larger goal, we, we've got to figure out how we do this together. And then the, I think um, the last sticking point that we bumped up against as a group was <coughs> getting the police department to include in their bulletin, um, which you'll see that they did, text acknowledging that sometimes it's law enforcement officers who are perpetrating the violence themselves. So what we heard from San Francisco Police Department is that never happens. Um, and it's already prohibited by general orders. Like We already have stuff there that, that prohibits it, so we don't need to say it again. And the group of community activists and agencies said, well, it's, that's great, and we're hearing from our community members that, in fact, they are having negative interactions with some officers, and it'd be very hard to come forward and report that if there's not this very clear acknowledgement of it. And at the same time this was happening, um, the case with the woman who was going by the name of Celeste Squap, I don't know if that registered on the radar up here. So it was a 17-year-old woman 
who basically implicated over 10 police departments across the Bay Area of officers paying to have sex with her and or, you know, saying, you know, let's have sex and I'll tip you off to when undercover operations or sting operations are happening so you can get indoors. So we have this huge story about the very thing we're saying is happening in some cases. Um, and the police department initially didn't want to include it, but, you know, if you want to begin to try to rebuild trust with these communities of people, the good faith measure is to include this. And we hear that you feel like this isn't currently happening in this department. We hope that's true. And if it's not happening, it shouldn't be an issue to include it. So ultimately, it got included. Um, it took three years to finalize the police department bulletin. So it's just a reminder of sometimes you've got to be in for the very long haul. And in actuality, three years is probably not that long of a haul for some of this work. Um, and have done community outreach events to make sure people are aware of it. And then an assembly member down in Southern California um, caught wind of it and said, well, that's a great idea. Why don't we have that as a state law? So, well, why don't we? Let's do it. So I think you all have that as a handout as well. What's fascinating, what took us three years to accomplish in San Francisco County took about four months to do at the state level. So it's also a reminder of when we invest in doing that harder cross-system collaborative work in maybe an area where we can get our arms around it better because we're all working in this community, we never know what that might lead to. And with things already written and sort of templates in place, it becomes easier then for other folks to take it on and adapt it. So it was um, you know, unanimous bipartisan support. There's actually no pushback against it whatsoever. Passed out of the assembly with the two-thirds vote that it needed, and then was just signed into law middle of June um, by the governor. There's some limitations. And you know me, I love to point out the limitations and critiques of things. So it's not as strong as our joint policies in San Francisco for two main reasons. One. They were not able to include in the legislative language that someone will not be arrested if they come forward to report it. All they could guarantee is that they will not be prosecuted. And the reasoning behind that was there's a separation of powers. So they don't actually have the authority to tell the, the police department what can happen. Um, but with this in place, it makes it much easier for folks in other counties in California to then say, hey, we need this important other piece, because really it's the fear of arrest that prevents people from coming forward to report when they're a victim of crime. Without that, I'm not sure how effective this is going to be. And here's template language from San Francisco that you can adapt pretty easily. Um, and then the other piece of it that's not as strong is that it doesn't prevent charges for other misdemeanor drug offenses. So at least in San Francisco, I'm not sure seen here in Portland, oftentimes those two charges can go hand in hand. Uh, so we would want guarantees of things that people most often are charged for in a moment they would not face. Um, in terms of the community and service providers and law enforcement coming together and the tensions there, I'm wondering if it ever came up or was acknowledged about, you know, because I will get like a lot of service providers as specifically anti-oppressive and their practices were up against law enforcement or the legal system, which, you know, we could argue is inherently, you know, systemically oppressive. So I wonder, you know, because yes, we might have the same goal, we don't want people to be trafficked, but how we're doing that and the systems we're doing that, I'm wondering if that point was ever, like, brought to the surface explicitly. Yeah, the beauty of San Francisco and the group of folks there is there is not a meeting that goes by that's anti-trafficking related where things are not named about uh, the ways in which different systems are oppressive. So not just law enforcement, we're equal opportunity finger pointers in San Francisco. <laughs> um, and in some ways some of the social service providers have aspects that are oppressive, right? Um, so that sort of links back to what I was saying earlier. Is it's on all of us to be open to hearing that not getting super defensive and figuring out, okay, what if this is really happening? 
What of this is historical legacy for how things used to be? How do we shift things? Um, so yes, it definitely came up. I think as I had mentioned, some people just wouldn't go to the meetings at all because it was too triggering for them um, to be in those spaces because when we would have the meetings, they'd either be at 850 Bryant, which is the county jail, um, in the police department's unit, or at the DA's office. And so even just going into that building is a barrier for some folks. And fortunately, there were enough other people involved that we could ensure those people's voices and perspectives could be represented without them having to go into a space that felt unhealthy for them. Um, there's also just the, the clash of cultures of the ways in which what is normalized maybe within our community-based provider organizations is very different than what's normalized within police departments. Um, so there was a meeting where you can get into the legalese a lot and there's a conversation between the DA's office and the police department about is it bad, should we include battery or assault or this and that. And someone, one of the community members asked, well, what's the difference? I don't know. And a sergeant from the police department turned to a community member without asking permission, physically demonstrated battery. That, that's a problem, right? And in that moment, it's like, oh, and you're wondering why we want language in there about when law officers are the ones perpetrating the violence. And so that, that became an a understandably big issue um, that was dealt with. And I think it's, you know, hearing from the person who perpetrated it, he's like, but that's what I would do with my coworker. Like, it wasn't, in his mind, it wasn't intentional. He didn't feel like he was doing something wrong or problematic. It's a very, it was a different culture and workplace environment. Uh, and so then having the conversation of, oh, and you need to understand from this perspective, for this young queer man who you just demonstrated battery on, who has history of being arrested, how that's really problematic. So I think that's, that's an opportunity, not one that we wish upon ourselves, to then say, let's, let's have these bigger conversations about how we move through the world and, and what's normalized, depending on where we sit. Um, um, this may or may not be right. So you, I've been hearing talk about like, trading money, trading sex for money. Can you? talk about trading sex for drugs, is that the same or not the same, or is that a precursor, or? So the question, um, did everyone hear it? Yeah, okay. People trade sex to get needs met, and they trade sex for things of value. So it can be money, it can be drugs, housing, food, security. That potentially could be. Are things of value. Right, so somebody who's trading sex for drugs, the scenarios, it, it all depends. Each individual is different, and each day of a person's life or moments of a person's life can really vary. But it could be, it's like, oh, well, I was gonna get the money to buy drugs anyways, so I'm just gonna get the drugs, and I know this person will give them to me. The work that I've done with young people, I think, um, Again, all of our research is limited in that it's not generalizable, but it's actually quite rare, studies I've done, some in New York, where you see a young person starting to sell sex to support a drug addiction. Now, once they start selling sex, they might start using drugs. I work in domestic violence, mm -hmm. and I hear people talk about using sex to get drugs, and I'm wondering if that's a red flag that I've been not understanding. A red flag for what? Trafficking. Oh, um, potentially a red flag that I've not been yeah. understanding. Yeah, so I think anytime we're working with community members and they're sharing things about their lived experiences, it's figuring out when it's appropriate to ask more questions. Mm -hmm. So just only going off of what you've just named, if they're trading sex to get drugs for themselves, unless they're under 18, which doesn't matter why they're trading sex, they're considered a trafficking victim. Um, if they're over 18, it might be that that's their most pressing need right now, and they're gonna trade sex to get drugs, and nobody's forcing them to do it. But without having that deeper conversation, it's, it's hard to know. Yeah, I think 
maybe the, the takeaway from that is, um, as the folks in this room know, as service providers, when we're working with people who are training sex, it's really trying to understand what needs are being fulfilled by doing that, including if someone's being trafficked by another person, the need to stay safe, right? And so by, I think using that language of what are the needs, what's working well about this for you, what's not working so well, what would you want to do differently, creates more of an opening so that people get to define it for themselves. Um, and then as astute, informed providers, if things are sounding not quite healthy or safe for somebody, it's then being able to explore that in a way that makes sense. Say, so for some of the young adults that are over 18 mm -hmm. that we work with, um, I tend to try to think of sex work that they might be involved in as empowerment, do this empowerment model where um, they are getting their needs met for something that they're looking to have their needs met with. Um, and Unfortunate sometimes, the people who are meeting their needs by giving them drugs for sex or money or goods or whatever um, are preying upon them then. So they're no longer, like their empowerment level in my mind kind of starts to diminish and go down and down. Um, and it's kind of this, you know, sometimes this balance of where are they still like actively being empowered and getting their needs met and where are they being now being more and more exploited by this person who's kind of wielding power over them and um, taking their control away from what they're you know, trying to get their needs back with. Yeah, so I, I think in general, when we're able to hold the space to let <coughs> someone define for themselves what it is, if they're saying this is empowering, we roll with that. And then the next time they might say something else, and we're like, okay. And then the third time, it's like, how do these two things match up? So on one hand, you're saying this. The next moment, you're saying this. Um, and what I will say is, I think there's, um, how best to phrase this, I'm thinking back to a study I did years ago where we were interviewing a, a cisgender adult women in the sex industry about their experiences. 350 women, and then we did qualitative interviews with about 40. And what I heard from some, they're like, you know, it's sort of exhausting to be doing a type of work where I feel like I always have to say this is awesome and this is empowering, and go me. They're like, in no other job, if I show up and say, oh, I had a bad day, or they're like, see, that's the problem, because you're a lawyer. What did you expect here, right? And so really being able to create the spaces where people get to have the moment where like, yeah, I had an awesome day today doing sex work. The next day, like, this client was awful, and I feel completely violated to, oh, I partnered up with this person. It really went sideways. Um, and not whatever our own internal belief systems are, not latching onto the one that best fits our own narrative, if that makes sense. So it's, it's really, especially I've been working with transitional age youth, which I'm assuming that's um, yeah. what I've gleaned just from who you are, of like 18 to 24 year olds. Lives are complicated and, and messy and we get to hold everything. There's a sign that I can't read. Five. Five minutes, okay, thank you. Um, the red font is not a good color for me. Thanks. That they need to be able to feel safe expressing whatever the experience is. And so we, we can exist on extremes if we really create a space where like sex work is only empowering, we're gonna alienate community members. And if we have a space where like it's only oppressive and exploitive, we've alienated people. Um, and I my belief is, and doing evaluations of different programs is oftentimes regardless of the outward presentation of a program, whether they portray themselves as sex worker rights or anti-trafficking, there are great people doing the direct service who are firmly rooted in harm reduction. Who are like, I'm just gonna meet this person where they're at, figure out what their needs are. If, if they're really just training sex to get access to food and they'd rather have access to food another way, let's get them access to food another way, right? The, the issue isn't sex trade, it's how do, how's this person meeting their needs in a way that's sustainable or viable for them. Yeah. We have probably four minutes now, so yeah. I have a, a comment and a question, but I'm curious as you look at this around the country, so those of us that have been involved in working on trafficking issues for a long time, like when the, G, the trafficking person's office was reformed in the first manifestation of the legislation, there were 
many debates, you know, all trafficking is prostitution. And I remember when the State Department <laughs> forbade grant recipients from using the word sex workers yeah. at all. It you know, feels like through that work, we shifted to some of the harm reduction approaches for the last almost a decade. But it feels like those we're having to have those same debates again. And the, the recent legislation you know, had this broad stroke. Do you, do you see that in your work, that we're having to kind of re-engage these debates? And maybe they were never put to rest, but yeah. kind of decide so we could work on this harm reduction approach. It seems never ending, doesn't it? It does. And it the more things change, the, the more they stay back, the same. Right? And in part, I mean, it's the TVPA, um, for those who don't know, actually has two definitions of trafficking in it. There's the definition of human trafficking, which includes all prostitution. And then there's the severe form of trafficking, which is the force, fraud, or coercion if you're over 18 or if you're under 18 doing it. So inevitably, built into the law itself is that conflation. And it was strategic. It was this seemingly unholy alliance between feminists and religious right um, that got that language that conflated all prostitution with anti-trafficking. I think what's shifted a little bit um, is we have many more people, such as most of us in this room, who are doing, for all intents and purposes, anti-trafficking work, yet are able to hold the nuances better, um, and are recognizing more the need to be proactive when legislation or policies or programs are being proposed to think through how is this going to benefit and or harm all of our community members. And I also think there's um, more organizing and activism among trafficking survivors who also don't feel like just cracking down on the sex industry is the answer. So there's a whole group of survivors against SESTA that came out against it. And that feels different. I think um, there's lots of, if we think back to that slide about ideal victims, there's lots of reasons why some people get listened to and others don't. And so it really takes figuring out who are the voices that we need to better amplify so that people understand the diversity so that we end up with better policies. Um, and then also just plug, there's a great umbrella organization called the Freedom Network. Um, and they're basically a coalition of lots of different anti-trafficking groups. And they're very clear in their language on their website that sex work in and of itself is not trafficking. And so you get some really interesting conversations among those groups of how do we work across systems and how do we cr work across issues and how do we best support everybody. So it looks like evaluations are being handed <coughs> out. Oh, we are at time. So um, here's lots of ways to contact me. I'll be around the rest of the day. I know not all of us feel comfortable speaking in spaces like this. So if there's something you really wanted to share or ask, feel free to come up to me at any point today or email me. I'm always happy to talk with folks and hear feedback, hear critiques. All of that. So thank you all very much and thanks for all the great questions and engagement. I really appreciate it.